Hey, what's up y'all? I'm Brent Gaming, home of the gaming, and y'all remember that Breath of the Wild game, right? The newest mainline Legend of Zelda game that came out like over two years ago? Of course you remember it, who could ever forget such a fun game with enjoyable and creative gimmicks such as weapons having the durability of glass, bosses that are about as tough as stomping on a Goomba, and realistic rain physics during mountain climbing. Because everybody loved that! In all seriousness though, I see Breath of the Wild as one of the best single player experiences that Nintendo has put out, because despite its minor frustrating gimmicks, the game has extremely fun mechanics, a beautiful aesthetic, and was overall such a groundbreaking game for the open world formula. One of the best features in this game, in my opinion, are all the shrine micro dungeons that are scattered across the world map. In addition to acting as a warp point, a good majority of these shrines hold creative puzzles and gauntlets that can twist the game's engines in ways that you don't expect. And to be honest, part of the reason I find these shrines so interesting is because the quality and level design for the shrines can be really unpredictable. For example, one shrine in the game is extremely lengthy, fun, and creatively put together, while another shrine just has you count balls. That's it. After realizing how different these shrines can be, it really got me thinking, how many shrines in Breath of the Wild are actually good? And so today, I'm ranking all 136 shrines in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild from worst to best. Now before we start this list, however, I'm sure that I need to make some things crystal clear. First of all, no, this is not a joke video. Even though I'm releasing this video on April Fools, this is a legitimate ranking that is entirely based upon my opinion. The actual joke here is that I was crazy enough to even create an hour long video on this topic in the first place. Secondly, I'll be ranking these shrines only on what the shrine itself contains, so any overworld shrine quest connected to the shrine will be disregarded for this list. Because of this rule, the Blessing Shrines and the Test of Strength Shrines will also have a lower ranking, since these shrines are not only ridiculously short and easy, but they are also extremely repetitive, as the Test and Strength specifically offer almost no variation between the different fights. Also, since this list is so huge, there's bound to be multiple placements that you'll disagree with. So please don't go into this video expecting to agree with everything on this ranking. On that point, since there are groups of shrines that are completely different from the others, let me address how exactly I'll be ranking all 136 of them. At the bottom of this list will be the shrines that I completely despise and feel like shouldn't even exist in this game due to just boring gameplay or multiple flaws in game design. The Blessing Shrines will then follow, ranked in order from least valuable to most valuable treasure, since these shrines literally only exist to give you a free item. After those specific shrines have been listed, the Test of Strength Shrines will be ranked based upon not only how great the treasure they provide is, but also ranked based upon the difficulty of the battle. These shrines are better than the blessing ones, but worse than the rest of the shrines in the game because of how repetitive and bland they are. I'll go into more detail about that claim later. And then finally, after all the copy and paste shrines are out of the way, the rest of the list will rank the remaining puzzle shrines based on the creativity, length, enjoyability, and difficulty that these shrines present, with the treasure that they give being a tiebreaker of sorts. Also, because a lot of the shrines are similar to one another, it will be very likely that I repeat terms a lot during this list. I've probably already drawn this section out way too long. And I think that's all everything I needed to say before we got into the main contents of this video. So with that said, here are all 136 shrines in Breath of the Wild ranked from worst to best. Ah! Number 136, Kyo Rug Shrine, Fateful Stars. I absolutely despise this shrine. It is by far the most stupid, most frustrating, and most confusing shrine in this game. Let me explain why I have such a burning hatred for it. The first thing you are greeted with once you enter the shrine is a small stone tablet rising out of the ground, which once you go up and examine it states, look to the stars for guidance. The constellations are the key. <sighs> So, like any reasonable person, I thought to myself, alright, so I must have to go outside the shrine at night and then look up at the stars. That must be how you saw this shrine. Ha! Wrong! All of the trees surrounding the shrine block any sort of visibility for any of the stars in the sky, if you can even make any out. So, after losing that one lead that I thought I had on the stupid uber cryptic message, I went back down into the shrine and see if I was just missing anything. That's when I noticed all the decorations in the background. For one split second I wondered if they had anything to do with the puzzle, but then thought to myself, nah, these types of patterns have been used as decorations for every single other shrine in this game. That's merely just symbolic aesthetics at best. It can't have anything to do with the puzzle. Wrong again! 
Even though these patterns are useless in every single other shrine, and are only used as aesthetic decorations, they are the one crucial key to solving this shrine, and are referred to as stars and constellations just to even make it more confusing for the player. And so, how do these constellations help you beat the shrine then? What do you do with them? Well my friend, you just count them. That's literally all you do. You just count them, and then beat the shrine. It's a counting game. It's not creative. I hope that now you can see why I hate this shrine. Not only is figuring out what you have to do in the first place confusing as heck, since you have to refer to decorations which have literally had no purpose up to this point, but the game makes it even more confusing by referring to these decorations as stars and constellations. Even a simple asset change or color swap would have made the shrine so much better, since then the player could actually realize that the things in the background have meaning and that they're used to complete the shrine. However, even worse than that, at its core, this shrine is literally just one singular counting puzzle that has no creative use of anything in this game's engine. For all of these reasons, and a couple more that I'm not just going to mention because, you know, this, this video is already long enough as it is, Fateful Stars is easily the worst shrine out of them all. Number 135. Oh my gosh. Kiro Mo Shrine Inside the Box. Oh, and do you really want to know what you do in this shrine? Do you really want to know? To complete this one, you are forced to use motion controls to count balls inside a box. Yes! Thank you, Nintendo, for combining everybody's two favorite mechanics into a super fun, long, and creative shrine puzzle. You know, let's just all give Nintendo a round of applause for this extreme expertise in level design that they have shown in this absolutely outstanding shrine. Ah, yes, such a fantastic... Number 134, My Himagana Apparatus. I'm sure this placement came as a surprise to, like, almost no one, as the My Himagana Apparatus is viewed by most of this game community as one of, if not the worst shrine in this game. And for good reason. All that can be found in this shrine is just one big maze puzzle that has to be completed with, you guessed it, motion controls. However, what makes this shrine so frustrating is that the motion controls in this game are nowhere near enough precise for how this maze is designed. Even just getting the orb around a corner of the maze is a pain in the butt, because the motion controls are so sensitive that you'll probably spend a good minute just trying to get the maze stable after all of your overcorrections. But hey man, why do the puzzle that the developers intended for you to do and overcome the difficulty that's presented to you when you can literally just flip your controller upside down and skip the entire shrine? Cause that's the most fun that can be had in this one, just purely skipping everything that it presents. So at the end of the day, this shrine is either just a complete mess of frustrating and poor level design, or it's just something that you can cheese and get your default reward for for skipping the main challenge. Either way, you'll be glad when you never have to do this shrine again. Oh, and by the way, never play this shrine on handheld mode. This shrine will be a million times worse if you try to. And you might even, like, throw your handheld switch into the wall out of frustration. So, yeah, just don't do that. That, yeah, okay, cool. Alright, so now that we've gotten those three abominations out of the way, we can move on to the next segment of this overarching list, where all of the copy and pasted blessing shrines will be ranked. Even though these shrines only exist to give you a free item, I still see them as better than the previous three already listed. Yet again, the thing that I'll be looking at to determine how good a blessing shrine is will be how good the treasure that they provide is. As such, these will be ranked rapid fire since there's nothing else to talk about other than what they give you. So let's continue with number 133 and 132, Daga Keeks and Magnora's Blessing. In the shrine, a silver rupee is the reward. Number 131 and number 130, Katawawi's and Dag Choka's Blessing. These shrines provide the player with an ancient core. Number 129, Suma Sahama's Blessing, gives out a Moonlight Scimitar. Number 128, Raka Zunzo's Blessing, gives the player a Radiant Shield. Number 127, Lanka Roki's Blessing, provides the edge of duality to the player. Number 126, Tukumo's Shrine. Tukumo's Blessing, this one gives the player a Royal Claymore. Number 125 and 124, Lano Ko's and Koryu Chide's Blessing, these two shrines both give the player a Golden Rupee. Number 123, Sa Katha's Blessing. This one gives out a Thunder Spear. Number 122, Gore Tor's Blessing provides the player with a Great Frostblade. 
Number 121, Jatan Sami's Blessing, a frost spear is what the player will get from this one. Number 120, Zuna Kari's Blessing, gives the player a flame blade. Number 119, Korsh Ohu's Blessing, provides the flame spear as a free item. Are you noticing a trend here? Number 118 and 117, Rona Kacha's and Shai Yotsa's Blessing, each of these two shrines give the player a great flame blade. Number 116, Tawa Jin's Blessing, rewards the player with a great thunder blade. Number 115, Thokati's Blessing, provides a golden bow. Number 114, number 113, and number 102, Mag Halan's, Ritag Zumo's, and Kun Sidiha's Blessing. All three of these shrines give the player a giant ancient core. Number 111 and number 110, Kihag Yugs and Masei Suma's Blessing. Each of these two shrines give the player a diamond, the most valuable ore in this game. What a Minecraft ripoff, SMH. Number 109, Kukaz Nata's Blessing. Gives out the rubber tights. In my opinion, getting armor as a reward is objectively better than getting a weapon or a shield, as armor is the only item out of those three that won't break. Gosh, can you imagine if armor actually did break? Don't get any ideas now, Nintendo, please. Number 108, Tano's Oha's Blessing provides the player with one of the most crucial items in the game, the climbing boots. And finally, the last three blessing shrines in the game, number 107, 106, and 105, Tukalo's, Kazatoki's, and Dila Mag's Blessing. These last three blessing shrines give the player a full barbarian armor set, with each piece giving you a slight increase in attack power. So now that all of the Blessing Shrines have been ranked, I'll be moving on to the next portion of this list, namely where I rank all of the Test of Strength Shrines. To those of you who are wondering why the Test of Strength Shrines place so low on this list, I find them to be not as good as all of the other Puzzle Shrines in this game, because there isn't anything unique or creative about them. Every single one of these fight trials uses the same type of enemy with the exact same AI and only marginally varies it up with the type of weapon that the Guardian Scout uses. Now, if every shrine had a different type of Guardian Scout enemy, such as ones that had a different attack patterns or different attack moves altogether, then that would be different. Anyways, yet again, these shrines will be ranked down the difficulty and how good the reward is for defeating this Guardian Scout. With that said, here at number 104 we have the Noya Neha Shrine, a minor test of strength. In this shrine, you fight a Guardian Scout that has an axe and get a Knight's Shield as the reward. Number 103, Da Kaso Shrine, a minor test of strength. You fight a Guardian Scout that has a spear and get an ancient core for beating him. Number 102, Katai Kuki Shrine, a minor test of strength. This shrine has you fight another Guardian Scout equipped with a spear, and it gives out a Royal Halberd as the reward. Number 101, Pumag Nate Nante Shrine, a minor test of strength. In this one, you fight a Guardian Scout that has a sword and a shield, and get a boomerang upon completion. Mind you, we've only gone over 4 Test of Strength Shrines out of the 20, and already all the different weapons and items that these Guardian Scouts can possess have been shown. The rest of the Guardian Scouts that you fight in these shrines literally all have some sort of combination of these 3 weapons and 1 shield. Yet again, this is the main reason why I find these shrines so repetitive and so bland. Number 100, So Kofi Shrine, a minor test of strength. This shrine has you fight another sword and shield guardian scout and gives you a knight's bow as the reward. Number 99, Da Heso Shrine, a minor test of strength. You fight a guardian scout. It has an axe. You get a giant ancient core for beating it. Number 98, Shoka Tatone Shrine, a modest test of strength. This shrine has you fight a guardian scout with his spear and shield and gives out a royal broadsword as the reward. Number 97, Kanai Shaka Shrine, a modest test of strength. Defeating a guardian scout with a sword and axe in this shrine will reward you with a sapphire. Number 96 and number 95, Sasakai and Miha Roki Shrine, a modest test of strength. Both of these shrines are exactly the same, you fight a guardian scout with a sword and a shield and get a frost blade after defeating it. Number 94, Namika Oz Shrine, a modest test of strength. This one puts you up against a guardian scout with a spear and axe and gives you a frost spear as the reward. Number 93, Muo Jim Shrine, a modest test of strength. In this test of strength you battle a guardian scout who's equipped with an axe and a shield. The reward at the end of the shrine is a royal bow. Number 92, Tenakosa Shrine, a major test of strength. This stupid shrine has you fight a Guardian Scout who has a sword, axe, and a shield. Ooh, the Guardian Scout has three items this time. Intimidating. Just kidding, of course. The Guardian Scouts with three items are only marginally more difficult than the ones that have two, because they both still have the exact same AI. Oh, and you get a freaking Knight's Halberd as the reward. 
Woohoo. Number 91, Kemakosasa Shrine, a major test of strength. Guardian Scout with Spear Axe and Shield, Silver Rupee as the reward, yada yada yada, you get the drill. Number 90, Goma Asag Shrine, and a major test of strength. Guardian Scout with Sword Axe and Spear and a Royal Claymore is the reward. Number 89, Hiamiyu Shrine, a major test of strength. Guardian Scout with the same arsenal as the previous one, and you get a Sapphire this time for beating it. Number 88, Sas Kosa Shrine, a major test of strength. Guardian Scout with a sword, axe, and shield, and the reward is a flame blade. Number 87, Tutsuwa Nima Shrine, a major test of strength. Guardian Scout with a sword, spear, and shield, and a flame spear as the reward. Number 86, Mozo Sheno Shrine, a major test of strength. Guardian Scout with the same weapons as the last one, be get a diamond instead of a flame spear for beating it. And number 85, Chaz Kita Shrine, a major test of strength. And the best test of strength shrine in this game only gets ranked as the best because it provides you with a climbing gear for beating it. Oh yeah, and I guess you fight a guardian scout with all three weapons too. Whoopsie, I guess I forgot that part. And now, having ranked all the Blessing Shrines and Test of Strength Shrines, we can now finally get into the meat and potatoes of this list. Ranking all of the rest of the unique shrines based upon their creativity, enjoyability, length, difficulty, and the treasure that they give out. The last attribute that I'll be ranking on will be more of a tiebreaker yet again, as all of the four attributes are much more important in determining how good one of these shrines is. So, let's get into it. Number 84, Talonag Shrine, Talonai's Teaching. This shrine is a 2 minute tutorial fight that only exists to teach you the fundamentals of the combat engine, such as parrying and flurry rush. I mean sure, it gives out 3 times as much treasure as any other test of strength shrine, but it's nowhere near creative enough to where it's enjoyable for the player. Do what the ominous voice tells you to do against the weakest AI in the game and you'll get your small reward. Nothing more to this one than that. Number 83, Dakako Shrine, Stalled Flight. This shrine is by far the shortest shrine in the game, not counting the blessing shrines. While the concept it uses is creative, it isn't expanded upon in the slightest, and is only used in its most basic form for the whole shrine. You're presented with a huge block of stone with an electricity generator on top, which continuously gets thrown up in the air and falls back down. All you need to do is get on top of the stone, use stasis at the top of its peak, and you're done. The optional chest is ridiculously easy to get as well. Just fly off the stone block to this ledge and you get 100 rupees. Yeah, like I said, using status wall on a mid-air object to beat a puzzle is a pretty creative concept. An ideal creative shrine would have used this puzzle here as an introductory test and expanded that concept with two more puzzles. That is generally the formula that the better shrines in this game have. As it is with this one though, you only have to complete an introductory puzzle to beat it, which ends up making the stalled flight shrine extremely easy and forgettable. Number 82, Kemazuth Shrine, a delayed puzzle. I have the same complaint with this one as I did the last shrine. It's ridiculously short, basic, and extremely easy to complete. Just use stasis on a mid-air electricity generator, knock it out of the air, and use magnesis on it to drag it over your switch, and get your spirit orb. Granted, this puzzle does at least have you use two of your runes instead of only one, and the chest is a bit more of a challenge to get. These reasons are why it's better than stalled flight, but they're not enough to place the delayed puzzle as better than any other shrine in this game. Number 81, Toto Sa Shrine, Toto Sa Apparatus. Can you say motion controls? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, motion controls can be a great mechanic when used correctly. For example, using motion controls to aim with the bone arrows is a great use of this mechanic, as the accuracy and sensitivity on the motion tracker is high enough for it that it just feels natural to use it. But here, in this idiotic shrine, you're put up against puzzles where you legit have to flip your controller upside down and rotate it in 360 degrees every direction possible to complete them. For that reason, even though this shrine is lengthy, it is such a general pain in the butt to get through as it has some of the worst motion control usage in this game. Number 80, Miro Shah's Shrine, Tempered Power. This shrine would be much, much higher on this list if it wasn't for one huge, extremely frustrating flaw in level design. For the challenges and tempered power, you have to build up momentum on an object by using stasis on it and whacking it into a far off hole with one of two slide chambers that the shrine provides. I find this overall concept to be enjoyable, but within the execution of the concept lies the fundamental problem. The sledgehammers given to you break only after a few hits. This problem becomes very apparent in this second challenge which is complete aids to try and beat. 
Hitting the ball seven times with a hammer will send it too far, but hitting it only six times doesn't launch it far enough. So, to complete this challenge, you literally have to use trial and error by taking the orb off of the podium and placing it in different areas, trying it from there. However, since the sledgehammers break, if you can't figure out the solution fast enough, you'll be forced to sacrifice the durability of all of the other weapons that you have in your arsenal, and that's just unfair to the player. Believe me, if you try and use other weapons to complete it, you'll probably end up breaking half of what you have before beating this stupid second challenge. Because of this massive flaw in level design, Tempered Power definitely deserves to be this low in the ranking, despite its creativity and length. Number 79, Ken Amut Shrine, Cryonis Trial. Now I understand that this shrine is meant to be easy. It's one of the first shrines that you encounter in this game, and its main function is just to introduce you to the Cryonis Rune. With that said though, the Cryonis Trial is the weakest rune tutorial shrine out of all four of them, as it only shows off some of the basics of this room, instead of revealing its full potential. Each puzzle in this shrine is easier than the last, as they all only require you to create one singular ice pillar on the ground to proceed, and nothing more. It would have been a much better tutorial if it also taught you the other basic uses of the Cryonis rune, such as being able to make pillars on waterfalls. It's not a horrible shrine, like there are some redeeming qualities, but it is still extremely bland, basic, and short, even for one of the rune tutorials at the start of the game. Number 78, Wago Kata Shrine, Metal Connections. This shrine is actually kind of clever, but at the same time, it is extremely short and simple, and can be frustrating most of the time. To complete this puzzle, what you need to do is stack these three metal boxes on top of each other, to climb them and get another metal piece on a higher ledge. After this, you need to unstack and restack these metal boxes near this ledge at such a precise distance that you can use the final metal piece as a bridge by angling it up at the top. The long metal piece especially can be pretty charm finicky to place up so high, as most times it'll just slide off and somehow knock over the metal crate tower. But once you get it in place, then you're home free to get another spirit orb, and that is the shrine. It's a shame that this shrine didn't present anything more than that. If it did, I'm sure this one would have been ranked much higher on this list. Number 77, Zalta Wa Shrine, two orbs to guide you. These shrine names keep on getting better and better, don't they? So the two orbs to guide you shrine may seem daunting at the start, but in reality, it's really surprisingly easy. First, you need to shoot this orb into the hole using a bow and arrow, which opens the doorway to another shrine orb. Then, with that shrine orb, all you need to do is stand on the switch and throw it into a second orb socket, which causes this tunnel to start moving. Then, just get inside that tunnel by hitting the shock switch and to launch yourself upwards, and that gets you right to the end of the shrine, where it honestly feels like, did I miss something? Is that really the whole shrine? Because sure, it does have three miniature puzzles, but they're all extremely short and basic, even for a shrine. What's more confusing is that the third puzzle is the hardest out of all three of them, and it isn't even based around the shrine's main gimmick that's literally stated in the title. It's still a semi-fun shrine though, despite it being basic and short. And hey, at least you also get a royal bow, so that's cool, I guess. Number 76, Hila Ryo Shrine, Drifting. A lot of the shrines on the lower end of this list tend to be pretty basic and short, in case you couldn't already tell. They're not badly designed, but they do feel like they could have had a lot more to them. This trend continues with number 77 of this list, Drifting. In this shrine, you cross over drifting planks of wood on water, and then use crowns so that you can blow up a stone wall to get to the end. This one does at least contain two treasures instead of one, so that is a plus. However, I saw almost nothing really that creative about this shrine when going through it, and even with the two treasure chests, it's still fairly short. Don't think I need to give any more reasons of why drifting got placed so low. Number 75, Kaya Wan Shrine, Shields from Water. And here we have a shrine that feels almost identical to drifting, the last shrine mentioned, as it uses the same mechanic of using a sheet of wood drifting on water as the means to get the spirit orb. Shields of Water only barely gets ranked higher than Drifting though because the puzzles are a bit more creative, such as creating ice pillars on walls to climb, or climbing around an ice pillar supporting a gate to grab a treasure chest. Sounds a lot better than just using ice pillars as stepping stones, doesn't it? The treasure to be had from the shrine is a bit more valuable than the treasure found in the Drifting Shrine as well, but seriously, Drifting and Shields from Water felt so similar that they really should have just been combined into one longer shrine, instead of being left as two separate ones. That definitely would have made for a much better shrine experience, in my opinion. Number 74, Ruko Meg Shrine, 5 flames, 
Five flames more like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Five flames is a somewhat annoying shrine because you use shock switches on a rotating cube to rotate a bigger cube so that five torches get litty. Not only are these shock switches pretty hard to hit if you don't want to waste any arrows, but the pattern with which how these switches correspond with the larger cube is very difficult to figure out. This is especially annoying because on one side of the larger cube is a water spout, which will destroy your progress with just a few unintended rotations. You're better off just shooting flame arrows to light the torches instead of using the tool that the developers wanted you to use. And yeah, that's, that's just the whole shrine. Just light the torches and you get another freaking spirit orb. Number 73, Sha Gemma Shrine. Shift and You raise a cube using Magnesis, you stasis on a moving platform, get the key, use the key, and get the spirit orb. Not a bad concept, but yet again, still incredibly short and simple. Number 72, Isho Sho Shrine, Bravery's Grasp. For those of you who actually played this shrine, did you know that you can actually pick up and carry the laser that's blocking the way to the optional chest? I'm sure that 90% of you that did attempt this shrine weren't aware of that at all. This is probably because the game gives no indicators that you can actually pick it up, and all the laser machines in the other shrines have all been stationary. So any logical person would conclude that, hey, I can't move that laser at all, and proceed to struggle with trying to complete this shrine the unintended way. But when and if you do somehow figure out that the laser is movable, then just place it on this moving platform and the shrine is an absolute cakewalk for to complete from there. Like, the actual challenge here is somehow figuring out that you can actually move this stupid piece of laser crap. Number 71, Bosch Kala Shrine, The Wind Guides You. This shrine is all about using your paraglider to ride gusts of winds. It's extremely simple, and if it's just the spirit orb that you're going for, then you should be able to complete it in about 30 seconds or so. However, the second optional treasure chest is decently challenging to get to, especially for newer players that don't entirely understand the wind physics yet. It's a nice shrine, but I just wish this one had more to it, because even for a shrine that's at the start of the game, it feels way too unnecessarily short. Number 70, Moakit Shrine, Metal Makes a Path. You know, this one is just okay. The optional chest is a pretty big pain in the butt to find since it's hidden in the freaking ceiling above some rock blocks which you have to break with a metal ball by bringing it all the way to the back of the start of the shrine. But you know, the main challenge of the shrine isn't that bad. To complete it, you use a combination of the status and magnesis runes to push away up hills that have boulders rolling down them. It's still kind of basic, but not enough to where you finish it feeling like there was something missing. So it's fine. Nothing more or less than that. Number 69, Oa Daim Shrine, Status Trial. This is a much better rune introduction shrine than the one for the Cryonis room. The main reason why it ends up being superior is because it manages to show off all the runes power with three basic yet completely different puzzles. The first one shows off the ability to stop time on a rotating object, the second puzzle demonstrates how you can stop time on objects already in motion, and the final puzzle introduces how objects and stasis can be hit to build power, launching them extremely far off when the effect wears off. The tutorial shrine for the stasis rune does what it's supposed to do pretty dang well. However, because it's still short and basic, it still gets a decently average ranking when compared to the rest of the shrines throughout Hyrule. Number 68, Shower Alone Shrine, Blind Spots. The main gripe I have with this one is that it's extremely tedious. You're required to hang on to slowly moving blocks down a hallway and position yourself so that you don't get hit by the obstacles in your path. Sure, this sounds kinda cool on paper. But the blocks in the shrine just move so slowly, which makes the whole shrine pretty dang boring. To add on to this, if you accidentally fall off of the blocks, you have to get back onto another block and redo the same hallway all over again. Wouldn't be so much of a problem if, like I said before, the moving blocks weren't as slow as molasses. It's a cool mechanic, but the poor execution of it ends up making this shrine one that's just subpar. Number 67, Ki Dafunia Shrine, The Melting Point. Same thing I said about the last shrine applies to this one too. The Melting Point is a decent shrine, but I just find it to be too tedious to be enjoyable, especially if you don't want to sacrifice one of your weapons for a torch. What you do to complete this challenge is wait around for ice cubes to melt so that you can proceed. This ends up being about as fun as it sounds. The ice cubes take way too long to melt, even when directly using a lit torch on them. Because of this, there's a lot of standing around and doing nothing with this one, which takes away a whole lot from that enjoyability factor that I mentioned. Some of the ways you can use the ice in this shrine are pretty creative, but the shrine would have been much better in general if it didn't require all of the waiting for long periods of time. Number 66, Jolu Na Shrine, Jolu Na Apparatus. There's actually some pretty dang creative and challenging puzzles in this shrine, believe it or not. 
to complete them though, the player is required to use, you guessed it, motion controls. And like I've said before, the motion controls in the shrines are incredibly slow and clunky, which makes a lot of the puzzles that require using them to rotate objects pretty dang unenjoyable at times. It's a shame, really, because if the motion controls weren't such a pain to use, this shrine would easily have made it into the top 30, if not 20 shrines on this list. As it is though, it just ends up being another one of those shrines that has really poor execution to some pretty cool mechanics and concepts. Number 65, Naiz Yoma Shrine, Pushing Power. This shrine isn't that bad, you know? The puzzle here has the player use Crownus to push a giant shrine orb down a hill so that they can use stasis to knock the orb into a hole, opening the door to the end. There is some BS where rock boulders can just drop out of your head once you get far enough up the slope, and there isn't that much treasure, but you know, it's a pretty okay shrine. You know, it's kind of like, kind of like Gucci, but not that Gucci, you know? <laughs> Gosh, I'm losing my mind to this list. Alright, uh, number 64, Yawaka Ida Shrine, Collected Soul. Collected Soul is one of those few shrines where you have to beat it without getting hit once, but that's actually pretty easy to do. See, the main challenge here comes from... Bruh. Okay, screw you too, Yawaka Ika. <laughs> As I was saying, the main challenge of this shrine comes from... Bruh. Gosh, freaking dang it! Part of the main challenge comes from the inner portion of this shrine, where you have to use a metal bowl to try and catch shrine orbs and chests that get launched into the air. It's challenging because you have to be so gentle and precise with the magnesis rune if you want a chance of catching anything. If you aren't gentle, the loot will probably just either slide out of the bowl or it'll just bounce right off. The death reception here is pretty messed up too. If that wasn't bad enough, once you get the orb, you have to walk up a hill of RNG crap previously seen without getting hit. Since the controls are so janky in this one and you can die to some pretty questionable stuff, Collected Soul is really not that enjoyable to delve through. Number 63, Shai Uto Shrine, Halt the Tilt. The puzzles in this shrine are pretty straightforward and simple as all you're required to do is use stasis on stone lovers so that they don't tilt to the side when you walk on them. It's a pretty neat concept that's actually executed pretty well here and doesn't overstay its welcome. The only major gripe I have with this one is that the second chest is way too complicated to obtain in contrast to how basic the main challenges are. See, while the final challenge in the shrine just has you use stasis to run up two levers instead of one, to get the second chest you have to backtrack to the first chest, use magnesis on it, bring it back to the all the way back to the end of the shrine, position it so that it's on the opposite side of the lever that you're on, and then drop it so the lever catapults you toward the second chest. Seeing as how this gimmick isn't used anywhere else in the shrine, and you literally have to guess that the chest is made of metal, since most chests in the shrine actually aren't, this second chest is an extreme pain to figure out how to get to. Plus, it only gives you an ancient core, so my advice is don't even bother going through all the confusing hassle to get it. Number 62, Rock Uwok Shrine, Power of Reach. The Power of Reach is a really interesting shrine because I'm not really sure what the main gimmick is that they're trying to showcase here with its puzzles. Maybe there just isn't one, who knows. In the first room, you have to light a bunch of leaves on fire, which opens up a passageway to another portion of the shrine. After this, you can move this bridge down using magnesis and walk over to these barrels behind bars and use a flame mirror to light them on fire, opening the door. This leads to a key, and using that key will on the locked door in the first room provides you with your spirit ball sphere orb. I kind of feel like I cheese this one, but I'm not entirely sure how you'd complete it normally. Even so, Power of Reach is a short, simple, and decently easy shrine but it does have a good amount of more creativity to it than a lot of the other shrines that we've already covered. Number 61, Oman Ao Shrine, Magnesis Trial. Being the very first shrine that players usually encounter in this game, the Magnesis Trial is actually a decent shrine overall, and is definitely a great rune tutorial shrine. Not only does it teach you all the functions of the rune through multiple short puzzles, but the puzzles are designed in a way so that the showcase of one particular function isn't too long or too tedious. It's basically a short, simple, yet semi-sweet shrine that does a pretty good job at what it's supposed to do. Number 60, Keo Makag Shrine, Metal Doors Open the Way. This literally feels like an extension to the Magnesis Trial. Legitimately, you could have swapped the shrine's puzzle with the main Magnesis Trial puzzles, and I don't think there would have been even that much of a difference. The concepts are almost exactly the same, but it does require a bit more brain power than the former. So, for that reason, it gets ranked one more spot higher. Number 59, Ya Rin Shrine, a weighty decision. The challenges presented in this shrine have the player use metal boxes so that they can use balance scales to progress through the shrine. Sounds kinda complicated, but in reality, the two major puzzles here are fairly simple. 
and when the puzzles are simple, they're not as fun to figure out and don't give the same sense of accomplishment as harder puzzles do. For that reason, I'm sure that this shrine is just one that a lot of people, including myself, tend to forget. It's still decently good though, it's just forgettable. Number 58, Zeikasho Shrine, Zeikasho Apparatus. Hey, would you look at that? It's a motion control shrine that's tolerable. This is because the puzzles in this shrine are designed with the slow motion controls in mind, and they actually don't require you to completely rotate your controller in every direction to complete it. Sure, the third puzzle can be kind of iffy at times, but this shrine is such an improvement compared to the other motion controls ones already listed. Number 57. G Hara Shrine Tandem. You use arrows to cut ropes to drop balls on switches. The layout and the presentation of the shrine is easily one of its best features, as the whole shrine is extremely straightforward and simple, while keeping the challenges decently challenging. Overall, there are three puzzles here, in which two are mandatory and one leads to a treasure chest with a Minecraft diamond in it, which is one of the best treasures you can get from these shrines. The second required puzzle in particular actually makes you think outside the box, as you have to use stasis on the stone ball before cutting both ropes so that it can fall straight down. So it's a short but very sweet shrine challenge that, while it doesn't stand out too much, is still enjoyable and creative. Number 56, Monya Toma Shrine, Drawing Parabolas. This one is a simple yet creative one room shrine puzzle. Here you're presented with three moving shrine blocks on stationary platforms with one of the platforms having a shock switch on it. Hitting the shock switch will turn the whole platform by 90 degrees, which in turn will turn the moving shrine block with it. By doing this you can set up a chain reaction using the shrine orb so that it moves from platform to platform essentially drawing parabolas in the air. It's a really neat concept that I think- It's a really neat concept that I really think could have been expanded more upon. As it is though, it's still a nice shrine with a pretty dang good reward for the optional chest within. Number 55, Mezalo Shrine, Ancient Trifecta. And here we have another one room puzzle shrine involving a shock switch that moves a platform with a treasure chest that contains a thunder blade as the reward. Sounds familiar, right? Ancient Trifecta is indeed strikingly similar to the last shrine that we've covered, but it's also different in many other areas as well. I saw a lot more creative different ways which the player could solve this puzzle than I did with drawing parabolas, and there's the result of that creativity and open-endedness, I decided it should have the higher place out of the two. Number 54, My Ilya Shrine, Secret Stairway. The challenges in this shrine have you use all of your main Chica Slate runes except the remote bomb to complete the main puzzles that it presents. By lifting these metal boxes using Magnesis and stopping them mid-air using Stasis, you can then build Cryonis blocks on this waterfall to catch said metal blocks higher in the air. Do this enough times and you'll be able to slowly climb this man-made staircase to get to this top. The timing with stasis can be pretty frustrating sometimes, as switching runes does have a cooldown, and the metal boxes fall pretty fast. However, this creativity here makes up for the slight frustration and ends up making Secret Stairway a solid shrine. The devs could have definitely done more with this concept though. Number 53, Katasa Og Shrine, Katasa Og Apparatus. I find this one to be the best shrine with motion controls as the main gimmick for completing the puzzles. Now granted, that's not saying much since there are still 52 other shrines that rank better than this apparatus one. However, the use of motion controls is probably the most creative in this shrine than any of the other apparatuses. And if you're the type of player that doesn't mind these types of motion control shrines, then you'll most likely have a good time with this one. In the Katasa Og Shrine, you essentially play mini golf by controlling a hammer to knock a shrine orb into a hole, opening the way forward. Now, there's only two of these puzzles, with one of them being optional, and the controls on the hammer can take some time to get used to. But even with these factors, I still found this shrine pretty dang creative and enjoyable, and showcases a neat concept that isn't like anything else seen in this game. Number 52, Sadahaj Shrine, Power of Fire. Essentially a tutorial for the shrines with fire as the main mechanic, this power of fire shrine is basic but pretty enjoyable. The shrine itself has a great structure and presentation, as it introduces the concept of being able to light leaves on fire, develops that concept by adding fire lanterns, and concludes it by adding a huge twist to said concept with a huge puzzle room at the end. This multi-step approach to level design is very similar to that used in the levels of Super Mario 3D World, where each one introduces, develops, and adds a twist to a concept that's only seen once. By the way, I'll link a video explaining this pattern more in depth in the description. Game Maker's Toolkit made a really well produced video on that topic. What I'm trying to get at is, the pattern for level design used in this shrine makes an enjoyable puzzle and challenge out of a concept that will only be used once or twice in the game. 
The main concept itself isn't as innovative or fun as concepts for a lot of the other shrines though, so I decided to give an average ranking for that reason. Number 51, Sha Warro Shrine, Path of Hidden Winds. More like just Path of Winds because they're not really hidden. Except the last one. <coughs> Anyways, this shrine is all about writing an updraft after updraft to reach the end of the very top of the shrine. While riding these updrafts, you have to constantly be on the lookout for obstacles that'll interfere as well as where the next updraft that you have to catch will be. Although the main shrine itself is very short, the concept is pretty unique and holds some decently valuable treasures as well, such as one of the best bows in the game. Hey yup, it's a good shrine, gets the official seal of Bramble's semi-approval, whatever that means. Okay, let's just, let's just move on. Number 50, Kyra My Shrine, Greedy Hill. One of the most unique shrines on this list, Greedy Hill is the only shrine that uses rupees as a main gimmick. There's not really a puzzle here, as you're presented with the challenge of having to dodge metal balls rolling down a steep slope while simultaneously trying to get the rupees that are coming down with them. There's nothing else in this game quite like this shrine, and I think that's part of the reason I like it so much. Plus, you can get a really good amount of rupees from it too. Quick tip, if you surf back down the hill after reaching the top, you'll be able to get most of the rupees that you missed. Only drawback is that you have to run up the whole hill again, which might take some time. But yeah, it's a pretty good shrine. Number 49, Ka Mail Shrine, Drop and Rise. This shrine takes the main concept from number 59 on our list, a weighty decision, and turns that concept into a single room puzzle by adding a twist to it. See, for this challenge, the components for completing it aren't exactly right in front of you. You're provided a metal barrel, but using that to just raise and lower the balance scale won't give you enough height to get to the end. Instead, there's a huge metal box cleverly hidden near the ceiling of the shrine, so that you have to look not only to what was first shown to you, but also to all of your surroundings. Then, after obtaining that box, dropping it on the same balance scale will give you enough momentum to be launched extremely high up, allowing you to paraglide to the end and get an orb spirit. Sphew. Shing. It's a nice shrine because it presents you with a challenge that makes you think outside the box by having you teach yourself that a previously developed concept can be used in more ways than originally shown. And you get a Minecraft diamond as a reward too! Yes! I love Minecraft diamond! Number 48, Dakatu Shrine, Sunken Scoop. Y'all remember Collected Soul, number 64 in this list? Well, Sunken Scoop is basically a much better version of that shrine, as it takes use of the same main gimmick of getting shrine orbs in a metal bowl, but makes the control so much more reliable. It also provides more puzzles than just one, adding in a unique twist to the main concept with a second. Because of these things, this shrine is so much more enjoyable and better than Collected Soul, and ends up being a pretty sweet shrine in general. Number 47, Shim de Go's Shrine, Moving in Parallel. In this one, you take indirect control of a shrine orb contraption by stepping on one of these two floor switches. See, each of these switches causes a part of the contraption to tilt when stepped upon, and by controlling those tilts, you strive to get two shrine orbs moving in parallel into two different orb sockets. There's not much more to this shrine than that, but it's not as simple as it sounds, as you also have to keep in mind the momentum of the orbs when trying to guide them into their different sockets. I find this concept to be an incredibly unique and enjoyable one that actually has a good amount of creativity to it, despite being kinda basic. Yet again though, and I feel like I'm being a broken record here, but I'm certain that this would have been much more enjoyable if they had made more than just one puzzle out of this concept for this entire shrine. Number 46, Vu Lota Shrine, The Winding Root. This shrine is a bit similar to the Path of Hidden Wind Shrine already mentioned. Here, you use your paraglider to ride the gusts of wind and updrafts around the room, allowing you to get a key and complete the shrine. It's actually a lot harder than the former shrine though, as you have to take clever use of your paraglider through these challenges to avoid all the spike traps set up in your way, such as putting away your paraglider mid-air not to soar straight into spikes, only to pull it out one second later to continue riding the wind gust. Because of these ingenious paraglider challenges, the Winding Roots gets a decently high ranking on this list. Number 45, Ha Dahamar Shrine, The Water Guides. In this shrine, you control a simple shrine orb rugged Goldberg contraption by placing cryonis blocks to help guide the shrine through the contraption and into the shrine orb socket. The shrine does a good job of teaching you that you can create cryonis blocks on waterfalls with two miniature puzzles before presenting you with a main challenge. Although, with how much the crownus on waterfalls gimmick is used, it should have definitely been taught to the player in the original rune tutorial on the Great Plateau. Regardless, this is a great and safe trial and error shrine, as you learn more about the shrine orb contraption the more you mess around with the Coronus block placement on the waterfall. This actually leads to a greater sense of accomplishment than a lot of the other shrines do. At the end, you feel like you earned the spirit orb because you learned and pushed through all the mechanics presented in the shrine. 
so it's a well-designed and creative and enjoyable shrine, despite being relatively short. Number 44, Sato Koda Shrine, Support and Guidance. It literally uses the same exact concept and execution as the last shrine mentioned. The only differences here are that the main challenge is a bit harder and more creative, and the treasure is slightly more valuable too, making this shrine slightly better than its predecessor. Number 43, Kano Shrine, Power of Electricity. The main format for this shrine follows the same pattern of the multi-step level design that was seen in the Power of Fire. Here, the shrine introduces the concept of electricity through the use of a generator, develops the concept by presenting a longer and more challenging puzzle, and then adding a twist on the electricity concept by showing how it can interact with water through metal objects and magnesis. The electricity shrines in this game are some of the best, mainly just because of the way electricity works with this game engine, is so well thought out and well executed. The power of electricity shrine does a great job at introducing this concept, while still providing enjoyable challenges and puzzles. Number 42, Kua Raim Shrine, a balanced approach. Being the last shrine on this list that uses the balance scale as its main gimmick, a balanced approach is a great final showcase for this mechanic as it adds multiple twists and a harder overarching challenge to spice things up. See, with this one you have to light a wooden box on fire so that the balance scale will drop and you can get a key. This will unlock access to three metal blocks, which you can then use two of them on one side and one on the other to lift the balance scale up to the end but not high enough so that you're impaled by spikes. This one took me a good 5-7 to seven minutes to figure out, and when a shrine is challenging enough to to where it takes that long for me to solve, as well as have an optional puzzle for another treasure chest, and that's a signal that this shrine might just be really well designed. And indeed, this one is. Number 41, Tamu Shrine, Passing the Flame. In this shrine, the challenges further develop the gimmick of burning leaves, creating some enjoyable and innovative puzzles. What's truly unique and what makes this shrine so much more creative though, is that the chests themselves in this one are actually burnable. So for one of the puzzles here, you have to light a path of leaves on fire, transferring the flame to the chest behind a gate. Once that chest catches fire and burns up, a key will drop out of it, which you have to use magnesis on to get it over the gate and be able to open the door. It's a shame that this puzzle is optional though, because it's so creative and such a mind twister, seeing as how chests never burn in any of the other shrines in this game. This shrine really makes you think outside the box, just like a lot of the other better shrines on this ranking. Number 40, Ja Bai Shrine, Bomb Trial. The Bomb Trial is easily the best rune introduction shrine, for not only does it teach all the main uses for the bomb rune in multiple clever and fun puzzles, but it also teaches an additional common gimmick at the same time. After learning that you can use the remote bombs to blow up stone walls and be able to detonate them from far away, you're presented with the final challenge in this room, which teaches you that you can use these funnels and movable blocks to launch remote bombs at targets. But at the same time, on the other side of the room, the game also teaches you that Shrine Orbs and Link himself can be thrown by these moving blocks, and rewards you for the chest for trying to do so. The additional puzzle wasn't necessary, but the devs decided to go the extra mile and include it in. Because of this, the bomb trial ends up as a rune tutorial shrine that not only excels at teaching you the fundamentals of this bomb rune, but also teaches you a gimmick that doesn't require this rune, but flows so nicely with the rest of the shrine that it just feels natural. And of course, once you complete it all, you get rewarded with another orb spirit orb. Man, don't you just love these things? Number 39, Shodasa Shrine, Impeccable Timing. This shrine takes the gimmick that was introduced in the last shrine, that is, shrine orbs launching from moving blocks, and adds a unique twist to this concept, presenting the player with two puzzles based around said mechanic. This time you control when these blocks launch the shrine orbs by hitting the shock switches near them. With that control in mind, the developers made both of these puzzles purely based around timing, as one has you launch a shrine orb into a moving socket, and the other requires you to launch a shrine orb into a socket guarded by moving platforms. It's a simple but creative shrine, and the layout of having one main mandatory puzzle and one main optional puzzle is a level design layout that really works well for these shrines. Number 38, Shada Na Shrine, Red Giveaway. Here you're required to use the Magnesis Rune to fix a broken wind rude Goldberg contraption guiding a shrine orb into another shrine socket. These, these types of contraption shrines tend to be common and they also tend to be some of the better ones in the game. With this one, have you used Magnesis to find the piece in the wall that you have to pull out, as well as the stasis to move as well as stasis on a moving platform while the ball is in motion does make this shrine take some brain power. However, the concept of being able to rock around and directly interact with a shrine of contraction, instead of indirectly controlling a limited amount, is what makes this shrine stand out as creative and enjoyable, in my opinion. Number 37, G No Shrine, On The Move. On The Move is one of the longer shrines in this game, as it follows the multi-step pattern in its level design, but applies that pattern on a larger scale. 
Each puzzle here not only grows in difficulty and length the further you progress, but they each take different creative uses of shrine orbs and conveyor belts. While the first two are fairly simple, using stasis on a moving ball knocking into a socket, the third puzzle is the one that really ramps it up as it adds a huge twist to the concept. Before you were indirectly interacting with the shrine orb, but now with this third puzzle you have to directly carry it across the conveyor belts while avoiding lasers in your path. Overall, it's a good shrine that really takes use of your timing skills in different and creative ways, while still hanging out to the same theme all the way through. Number 36, Rin Oya Shrine, Directing the Wind. Directing the Wind is a slightly better and more challenging version of the Red Giveaway Shrine, which was number 38 on this list. The main reason for this is because the optional chest is a lot more puzzling to figure out how to get. Instead of just using Magnesis and getting a free treasure, you actually have to remove a piece of the contraption after the shrine orb has passed it and bring it up with you as a bridge to obtain the chest. This extra challenge definitely puts a lot more oomph to the shrine's execution of the concept. Number 35, Dao Nai Shrine, 3 Boxes. Here in this one, instead of the treasure chest being optional challenges throughout the puzzles, they're actually a mandatory part of the main gimmick, making this shrine incredibly unique and creative. After collecting all three treasures in the chest, you can use Magnesis on them and place them all on a giant switch in the middle of the room, allowing you to progress and get your gosh darn spirit orb. It's almost like a collectathon shrine in a sense. Even though it's simple, three boxes is still very different, creative, and overall enjoyable to complete. Number 34 and number 33, Shivanir and Shivaneth Shrine, Twin Memories. The only reason the two Twin Memories Shrines are this high up on this list is because, despite being short, they both contain what is easily one of the most unique and creative shrine puzzles in this game. They're not that challenging, but there's nothing quite like them, as the way that they work with each other is incredibly innovative. Plus, these are the only two shrines that actually have you use the camera rune unless you're just chief and use the picture button built into the switch. Anyways, each of these shrines contain a 5x5 socket field with 5 shrine orbs in a specific pattern. The twist is though, each of these orbs need to be in different sockets to complete the puzzle, and the specific pattern which they need to be in is shown by the other shrine orbs placement. Essentially, both shrines are the solution to the other one, and you have to travel back and forth between the two to completely solve both puzzles. It does suck that the optional chest is just a freebie, and doesn't hold any challenge to getting it, but the main concept of these shrines more than makes up for that minor nitpick that I have. These two shrines definitely stuck out to a lot of Breath of the Wild players as two of the most creative shrines, and for good reason. Number 32, Kiev Tala Shrine, Big or Small. It's an electric contraption shrine. Good shrine. It has good difficulty. Good shrine. Number 31, Renu Honika Shrine, Block the Flame. Despite being relatively easy, Block the Flame is a nice continuous gauntlet of miniature puzzles that take use of the concept of blocking or destroying fire geysers to proceed. There is a bad motion control section at the end, which sucks. I agree. Even with the motion controls though, this shrine is still incredibly enjoyable and well designed in its layout, having you use a good mix of multiple different mechanics to make it to the end and get your Orbis Spear Chests. Number 30, Shay Loya Shrine, Aim for the Moment. This is one of the only shrines that revolves around the time slow mechanic while shooting in air. The puzzles and challenges are simple in nature, but just a blast to play through and complete. Even though it isn't that long, it still presents more of a challenge than a lot of the other short shrines on the list, and definitely has more enjoyable and definitely has a lot more enjoyability to it. It holds some pretty dang good treasures too. For what it sets out to do, Aim for the Moment is a fun, clever, and overall a well-designed shrine. Number 29, Kaya Shrine, Quick Thinking. Overall, this shrine has the same layout that the Impeccable Timing Shrine had, one main challenge that is mandatory and another main challenge that is optional. Even though these challenges are decently short, they're both relatively difficult and enjoyable, as they both test your reflexes and reaction time, each in different ways. While one challenge has you moving a barrel around on a moving platform so that it doesn't get knocked off, the other optional challenge is the better of the two as it has you quickly shoot a shock switch to open a gate, then quickly realize you have to shoot it again to open up a gate further up. Speed challenges are something that aren't used very often in shrines, so it's refreshing and enjoyable when they are actually used. That type of gimmick combined with the layout of this shrine definitely makes it one of the better ones in this game. Number 28, Toyasha Shrine, Buried Secrets. This is a shrine unlike any other, as the way it takes use of the bomb rune is completely unique, different, and innovative. In short, you just play Minecraft with the remote bombs! Yeah, Minecraft! All jokes aside, the way you have to blow up basically the entire room before you can fully complete this shrine makes it stand out. If I'm being honest, it's just fun to use the bomb rune for all of the destruction, and then use what comes out of the dust as the solution for the puzzle. Even though it's not that challenging or lengthy, it's still extremely fun, and is definitely a groundbreaking shrine! <laughs> and my suffering, please! Number 27, Barita Nag Shrine, Canon. 
Canon is a shrine that introduces a concept that is easy to learn but extremely hard to master. It's by far one of the most difficult shrines to beat all the challenges in. With this one, you're required to load a remote bomb into this funnel, which you can detonate once it's reached the bottom to send a shrine orb flying at the target. Once first fired, four moving platforms will activate with the purpose of trying to block the shrine orb headed to the target. As long as you use stasis on one of the platforms, you should be fine. But then you're presented with the third twisted optional challenge where the target itself is now also moving. Seems hard, right? Well, it definitely is challenging to beat this last puzzle, and that's part of the reason why I love it. Instead of the optional challenge being easy to beat, it instead requires you to show that you have mastered the concept before giving you the reward. I feel like many shrines are just too simple to complete, so this extra challenge to this one is something that I extremely enjoyed. Besides, the main gimmick itself is just enjoyable and innovative. Number 26, Shira Gomar Shrine. Aim for stillness. And here we have another shrine that uses the ideal multi-step layout in level design, which, when implemented, really makes the shrines in general a lot more enjoyable. This time, Aim for Stillness introduces the concept of using your remote bombs in the wind to blow up faraway rock blocks, developing the concept by showing the same can be done vertically even using a funnel, and then concludes the shrine with a final challenge that adds a giant twist to the overarching concept. Here, the funnels and wind turbines are attached to the giant rotating gear which the player stands upon, and by using stasis at the exact right moment, the player can line up the funnel and send the bomb straight at the rock block so that they can soar on the wind and finish the shrine. Now the treasure in this one is pretty dang wimpy, but the main challenge and layout are exactly the way shrines should be made in my opinion. This shrine is also fairly lengthy and challenging, and the main gimmick behind it is satisfying to master. If only we had more shrines in this game that were like this one. Heck, I would have settled for a lot less shrines if they all were at this quality of level design or higher. <laughs> Number 25, Cam Uruk Shrine, Trial of Passage. Do you have a hard time thinking in a three-dimensional 360 degree setting? Well then you're going to struggle a lot with this unique and extremely creative shrine. Its main puzzle takes place inside of a rotating cylinder with a giant gear system locked inside rotating four shrine walls with it that you can move or that you can maneuver on inside of the cylinder by using stasis on the main gear you're able to stop the rotation to progress using the walls without sliding off of them pretty clever huh in fact the whole structure and execution of this shrine is incredibly ingenious and you'll need to use a good amount of brain power to even comprehend how to solve it these reasons are why the trial of passage is one of the most memorable and well designed shrines in this game Number 24, Ku Takar Shrine, Melting Ice Hazard. Melting Ice Hazard takes the gimmick of avoiding fire geysers as seen in Block the Flame, and does a much better job at executing the concept and making it enjoyable all the way through. It's the only shrine in this game where reaching the end isn't enough, as you have to take an ice block with you all the way to the finish. Of course, the problem is, there are an abundance of fire geysers scattered throughout the path, threatening to melt the cube if you happen to run into them. And just like the other fire shrine, Melting Ice Hazard does a good job of introducing the concept, developing it, and adding a twist to it at the end by having the player have the effects of two different runes going on at the same time. Eventually, you'll learn that you can use stasis on the ice block, which leads to some pretty clever puzzles on blocking the flame so that the ice cube can proceed. Fun challenges, cool concepts, and a well-designed layout are all the attributes that place this shrine as high as it is on this ranking. Number 23, Re Dahi Shrine. Timing is critical. Here we have another three puzzle shrine that follows the pattern of the multi-step level design layout. Seeing a trend here? If the shrine has this layout over its main mechanic, then it's usually one of the better shrines in this game. The puzzles in timing is critical have you controlling a shrine orb indirectly by tilting elevated platforms with floor switches. The reason why timing is critical here is because with the latter two puzzles, you'll have to time when you step off the switch to just right for the orb to make it into the socket with the momentum that it currently had. The flow and challenges of this one are enjoyable enough, but the true icing on the cake is that this shrine provides you with one of the best items in this game. After completing a fourth optional puzzle that has you think outside the box, you'll be rewarded with the Climber's Bandana. Trust me, don't sell this item, ever. It will be so useful for your entire playthrough of this game. Number 22, Yanaga Shrine, Shatter the Heavens. It's a good shrine, has it used both bomb runes and stasis at the same time. Very short but very creative, good shrine, a very fun shrine, good shrine. Number 21, Rota O Shrine, Passing of the Gates. 
This one is an exceptionally weird shrine, but weird in a good way. In the middle of this shrine rests a gigantic gate with multiple different features on it, and shooting this shock switch will cause the whole entire mechanism to rotate 90 degrees on the Y coordinate plane, so to speak. With this in mind, you first have to make yourself very familiar with this gate and everything on it before you begin trying to solve what it presents you with. The puzzles here are so in-depth that they would take me much longer to explain than I would want to take. So just trust me when I say they're very different and innovative, taking use of generic shrine properties in ways you'd never expect. It took me a surprisingly good while to figure this one out, but once I did complete it, I just looked back on the whole shrine and thought, dang, that was really well designed. Number 20, Kamiya Omuna Shrine, Moving Targets. If you complete the main storyline of this game, which is actually required to do before you access this shrine, you might remember a section of the volcanic area where you were required to use aimable cannons with remote bombs to blow up rubble preventing you from progress. No? You don't remember that? Yeah, I don't blame you honestly because that section of the story sucked. Regardless, the concept of an aimable remote bomb cannon was a really cool one, and moving target takes that barely touched upon concept to the next level, so to speak. This shrine is very similar to cannon, but it further develops the concept in an inventive way as now you can control where the cannon aims by using shock switches to tilt them from left to right. With that addition, this shrine presents 5 different puzzles and challenges that you go through before absorbing the spiritual sphere that the bald Chinese guy gives to you. Yes, the final 2 challenges do require some motion controls, which can be frustrating at times. However, this is a lot more excusable, as the motion controls aren't the main gimmick of this shrine. The actual main gimmick is fun enough to where it more than makes up for the inclusion of these motion controls, and ends up as one of my favorites. Also, if you have sh also if you show that you've mastered this concept by performing an extremely well aimed shot near the beginning, then you'll be rewarded extremely well with a Terraria Diamond. Number 19, Takama Shiri Shrine Dual Purpose. Following the same multi-step level design layout mentioned a million times already, Dual Purpose takes use of the metal objects conducting electricity gimmick to power doors, but this time with an overarching addition to the concept. Now, on top of allowing electricity to flow through these metal boxes, you also have to use them as a bridge by temporarily stopping the flow of electricity with stasis. The shrine takes that gimmick and makes three clever, unique, and extremely enjoyable puzzles out of it, yet again using the engine in unexpected ways. The third puzzle especially will take some time to figure out as the boxes which you can actually climb are now broken apart so that you have to think about how to line them up and use them as conductors simultaneously. Overall, it's a very refreshing and enjoyable shrine that doesn't overstay its welcome, but isn't too short either. Number 18, Rota Chiga Shrine, Stop to Start. Easily one of the hardest shrines in this game, Stop to Start begins with a simple main puzzle that quickly ramps up the challenge and complexity with unique and challenging gimmicks later on. This is another one of the shrines where you have to complete it without getting hit once, which does add to the enjoyment but sadly takes away from the replayability. Not like shrines are replayable in the first place. <laughs> You'll first start the room with a moving spike floor supporting three movable metal pieces on it, which you have to use magnesis and stasis on to actually traverse over. It's not as hard as it sounds, and I'm pretty sure you could do it without even using stasis. After this, you encounter some pretty creative challenges combining gears, conveyor belts, and spike walls, where you constantly have to fight the momentum of these contraptions to not be pushed to your death. The next challenge is where things really start to get tricky and creative, as after you paraglide past three spiked wrecking balls, you're presented with a floor switch which, upon crossing it, will cause a death wall of spikes to slowly chase you down a corridor. On top of this wall it's chasing you, there's also spike walls that will rush in and try and catch you off guard if you rush this portion too fast. That sounds pretty dang cool, right? Well, that's because it is. Even though the presentation is a bit rough, the challenges are much more creative and enjoyable than other shrines, especially with the last challenge presented here. Number 17, Shei Rata Shrine, Speed of Light. This shrine is like one huge speed trial mixed in with optional challenges that stretch the brain, which makes the shrine as a whole incredibly unique and extremely enjoyable. A shock switch at the side of the room will raise and lower the water level, but if you use the spin dial at the start, there will be a few seconds delay on it, allowing you to cross all the way over the water to the other side of the room if you're speedy enough before the water completely drains. With the water gun and you in the other side of the room, you can drop a metal barrel on a switch to activate the door. However, if you wanted to get the optional chest, things get even more complicated and creative, as you need to figure out how to raise the water level again once you've crossed over. All in all, this shrine is a very neat speed trial challenge that actually has a lot of depth and is pretty dang fun. This shrine also gives out one of the most unique weapons in the game, being the giant boomerang. Try not to lose this weapon the first time that you use it though. 
Number 16, Doonba Taig Shrine. Build and release. As a whole, this shrine is everything that tempered power should have been and more. The storming power with stasis gimmick is used so creatively in this shrine and the layout is so different and unique that I was actually surprised at how much I was enjoying it this one when I first encountered it. After a quick introductory puzzle that only exists to show the heavy switch mechanic, this shrine presents you with an expansive room with three different puzzles immediately at your fingertips that you can do in any order. For the main two puzzles, there are four barrels for each one, which by using the stasis rune on them, you can actually use them as ammo to knock down stone blocks and push in switches to complete the challenges. Not only does this just feel a lot more creative and fun than the temporary power did, but it's not brokenly difficult as though each puzzle does present a challenge, but definitely challenges that aren't too hard to overcome. You might break one weapon in the shrine, but that should be it. Plus, I really enjoyed the layout of the shrine, having three open-ended puzzles each laid out in an expansive room was something you don't often see, which really sucks because I thought it was used really well here. But come on man, you use barrels as ammo with stasis to send flying into switches into the shrine. If that doesn't sound cool and shout creative, then I don't know what does. In the end, this shrine is just another blast to complete all the way through. Number 15, Etsukurima Shrine, Path of Light. As soon as you enter this shrine, you can immediately tell that it's completely different from all the others because almost everything is pitch black. The only source of light that you have at the start are the torches on the wall, and as you progress through this shrine, more light sources will appear, with some sources from objects that will actually kill you if you touch them. See, this is another one of those shrines where if you get hit once, then you lose, and in this scenario that gimmick works perfectly. From maneuvering through a miniature laser maze to going up against guardian scouts in the dark that are actually a challenge now, this shrine feels like a complete different experience from all the others. It throws together ideas that would have been nowhere near as enjoyable with lighting and executed them very well so that they're enjoyable and daunting in this pitch black setting. Easily one of the best shrines in this game. Number 14, Maka Ra Shrine, Steady Thy Heart. Steady Thy Heart combines a great variety of puzzles, innovative challenging combat, and reflex challenges to create an incredibly enjoyable and substantial mini dungeon that never has a low point. Once you carefully cross over a rotating pillar of spikes, you're putting up against four guardian scouts in an area of shallow water. The water is important here because it actually hampers your running speed, making it almost impossible to just rush in toward the guardian scouts and melee them to death. This requires the player to be a lot more strategic with their fighting techniques and is something that I wish that was used more in other shrines because it actually made the combat a lot more enjoyable. After this, two more inventive reflex tests and two optional chest puzzles are what's left of the shrine, with some of the treasures being extremely valuable. Even though it's slightly shorter, Steady Thy Heart has probably the most variety in its content and extremely and unique reflex challenges, all reasons why it's ranked near the very top of this list. Number 13, Kia Toza Shrine, Master of the Orb. This shrine holds what is potentially the most complex and involved shrine orb contraption in this game, as it'll have you using almost every single rune both beforehand and when the contraption is running to ultimately, you guessed it, get the shrine orb into the socket. It's also easily the most enjoyable shrine orb contraption in general. The contraption here is probably the longest and most in-depth one out of them all, as you yourself walk around it, fix the parts that are broken, and adding the parts that are missing. For a one room puzzle shrine, Master the Orb is shockingly good and enjoyable all of the way through. What more could you ask for from a shrine? Number 12, Ma Glaton Shrine, Sink Swing. Here, the challenges take use of the Magnesis Rune in such creative and unique ways that aren't seen in any other shrine and perfectly implements this innovative gimmick with multiple lengthy and enjoyable puzzles to complete. The ways it has you use the rune can range from swinging a hanging metal piece to give it momentum, allowing you to cross over it like a swing, to using, to using it to use motion of metal blocks to stack them up like a staircase so that you can cross. The optional chest of this challenge here is even more creative, as after you get it you have to take those same blocks and create a reverse staircase with them to get back to where you started. Of course, that's not to mention all the other in-depth miniature puzzles here, as they're all actually quite numerous and enjoyable. Again, again, for the 56th time. This is a good shrine, in case you couldn't tell. Number 11, Dego Chise Shrine, the whole picture. For a one room puzzle shrine, the whole picture is innovative, clever, enjoyable, and is nowhere near a cakewalk to complete. Man, I'm getting tired of saying the same things over and over again. There are electric power lines all over the floor of this room, and you constantly have to move metal pieces all over the place to continuously unlock more met to unlock more metal pieces, which allow for more possibilities than the way it is that you can link the power lines. 
just please trust me when I say it's a very, very good shrine. Easily one of the most creative on this list. Thank you. Alright, here we are, the final 10 of this ranking. I'm a lot more passionate about these 10 shrines than I am about a lot of the others on this list because in my opinion they perfectly reflect how the best shrine level design should feel, function, and be laid out. And get this, some of these shrines in the top 10 are so good that they're actually replayable. So let's wrap up this freaking ranking with number 10, Show Dantu Shrine, 2 bombs. This shrine takes use of both of your bomb runes in an extremely creative way and leaves the experimentation and learning curve entirely up to the player. You start in a room with three doors. Two of them are closed off with no entryway, so the only way to go is through the door to the left by breaking these wooden boxes. This leads to the first puzzle of this shrine, which shows a twist on the moving block launching bombs gimmick, as by timing the explosion just right, you'll be able to activate a shock switch behind grating to open the second door in the main room. Once opened, this second door will lead to a similar puzzle, except now the switch to activate the moving block is all the way behind the column in this middle here. So now, not only do you have to perform one well-timed explosion, but you also have to tie that explosion in with the second bomb. By placing the second Q-bomb next to the shock switch and the spherical bomb on the launch pad, you can activate the Q-bomb from far away, allowing you to activate the spherical bomb mid-air once the launch pad activates, activating a third shock switch. Now, if that wasn't epic enough, completing this puzzle will open the third door, which will lead to one huge comprehensive puzzle that requires a lot of mind-bending, thought, and experimentation. Two launch shrine blocks are moving in a continuous pattern back and forth opposite one another with a shock switch in the middle up top. What I love about this puzzle is that it requires so much trial and error before you can finally figure it out, as by just experimenting you'll learn about attributes of the different bomb runes that you didn't even know existed. For instance, did you know that the Q bomb is slightly heavier than the sphere bomb? So by placing both bombs onto one of these launch pads, the spherical bomb will continuously be launched back and forth over the switch while the Q-bomb will land right next to the switch and stay put. With that in mind, you can activate the shock switch twice in a row without doing anything more, and that's what you're required to do to complete this puzzle. At the end, this shrine is about timing, it's about experimentation, it's about thinking outside the box by using both bombs at the same time, a thing you'll probably never do at all anywhere outside this shrine and shatter the heavens. On top of that, these puzzles that are laid out here that follow the multi-step level design pattern actually feel like incredibly well-crafted puzzles, as then it will not only take some time to complete, but all three of them are enjoyable all of the way through. Number 9, Shea Mosa Shrine, Swinging Flames. With this shrine, the challenges are all scattered throughout an extremely open-ended and expansive room, using the fire gimmick and extremely inventive ways that all connect with one another to give the shrine more of an actual mini dungeon feel, instead of just a few puzzles slapped together and call it a shrine. As soon as you get past the introductory puzzle where you have to literally think outside of the box you're in to proceed, you might just be overwhelmed at first by how expansive the room is for a shrine and how many components there are to work with. That's what's great about this one, it exceeds expectations in so many ways. The puzzles not only flow together, but are also extremely creative and a good showcase of how the fire gimmick works, mixed in with some slight combat in the middle to mix things up. And as soon as you get that key from cleaning all the puzzles in the main room and use it on the door in the back, it honestly feels like that's probably the end of shrine because that's where most shrines would call it good. I was actually pleasantly surprised to find that the devs decided to go the extra mile and give you one last comprehensive puzzle behind that door before allowing access to the monk's pedestal. What I'm trying to get out here is that Swinging Flames is an exceptionally good shrine because the puzzles are enjoyable and flow together very well, the layout is expansive and unique, and overall, this shrine just goes the mile where others wouldn't. That's why I enjoyed it so much. Number 8, Akvakot Shrine, Windmills. Windmills is easily the best one screen puzzle in this game, because unlike almost all of the others, it's creative, enjoyable, has more to it than just the one puzzle shown to you, and get this, it's hard. Oh, it's hard as heck to figure out, let me tell you. It'll stretch your brain and might even leave you completely stumped, but that is what makes it so great. You're given a puzzle with 6 wind turbines and 14 power fans, and each of the turbines have a shock switch in them that, once hit, will rotate the fan 90 degrees clockwise. The challenge here is getting all of the wind turbines aligned properly so that they're activating all 14 of these power fans. Let me assure you, even though it sounds easy, it is nowhere near easy. The turbines are placed in such weird places relative to the fans that it'll take so much thinking and experimenting to actually get the puzzles to work. And here's the best part, the shrine knows if you're trying to cheat. If you use a Korok Leaf to try and power the fan yourself, and use stasis on a fan to keep it activated, the door will just automatically shut as soon as you use the stasis rune. 
it requires you to beat it at its own game without cheesing anything. And that's a great thing because the shrine is one of the only actual puzzles here as a lot of the other puzzle shrines just feel like gimmick showcases and were extremely easy to figure out and complete. This shrine also rewards exploration, as if you go all the way to the back of the shrine, you'll find a hidden alcove, which will lead to an archery challenge with three treasure chests scattered around. All in all, this shrine is extremely challenging and creative, and it ends up being way more than it needed to be for this game. And those are the reasons why it gets ranked in the top 10. Number 7, Dako Ta Shrine, Electric Path. As I've said before, the electricity engine in this game for the shrines is easily one of the most creative and fleshed out engines in this game, and Electric Path is one of the best shrines at showing all the insanely creative ways that this engine can be used. Just like Swinging Flames, its expansive layout makes it feel like an actual mini dungeon, as there are, get this, more than three puzzles that you'll have to get through before beating it. What a shocker, right? The whole shrine as you bring this square electricity generator with you throughout the whole way, allowing you to activate all of these power switches to power platforms that will allow for further progression. Which by the way, the progression itself is so unique in this shrine, each puzzle flows extremely smoothly from the last, even better than they did in Swinging Flames, as there are no doors ruining immersion between the challenge years. Oh, and don't think it's easy, especially if you're going for all the treasure chests, this shrine will have you use your runes and this shrine will have you using your runes in ways you probably never even thought of, such as using momentum on a moving platform as momentum for moving a block using magnesis. Trust me, you're gonna get your butt beaten by so many unexpected interactions and mechanic of electricity in the shrine, but that's just one of the reasons why it's so great. Number 6 Hawa Koth Shrine, The Current Solution Just when you thought that these electricity shrines couldn't get any more creative or enjoyable, the current solution shrine comes in and just acts like, yeah, screw all that other crap, this is the real electricity shrine here. The puzzles here are basically everything you could ask for in a shrine. They're creative, in-depth, challenging, and most importantly, enjoyable to figure out and complete. You can just tell that a lot of effort was put into the creation of the shrine, and it shows, as every single puzzle here is innovative and extremely fun to figure out and complete. From using blocks to diagonally conduct electricity to avoiding power lamps while walking over a bridge with an electricity generator, to even using stasis to get blocks of stone with wires on them lined up properly, this shrine feels like it has it all. But yeah, just all the fun puzzles and challenges here really make this one stand out to me as one of the best, especially since there are so many creative mechanics and concepts that flow together so well. Number 5, Ruva Korba Shrine, a major test of strength plus, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, this is a major test of strength shrine, right? So it belongs way back at the bottom of the list, at around number 90 or so, right? Surprisingly enough, no, it doesn't. Why? Because this one's enjoyable. It's unique, it's different, it's challenging. But most importantly, get this, it's actually incredibly replayable. Now I know I'm sorry, that's a lot of information to take in, and I apologize if I came too bluntly because I'm still, some of you are still recovering from a seizure after hearing that mind-blowing information. Yeah, no. So let me back it up and explain why this shrine is so different, and in turn, one of the best shrines here. A major test of Strength Plus is one of those DLC shrines where you die in one hit. However, the reverse is also true, you can kill an enemy with just one swing of your sword. With that concept in mind, when I saw this shrine was a major test shrine, I honestly thought this was going to be the easiest shrine in the game. And so I went up to the guardian, hit it once, and the door opened to the exit. Easy as pie, right? Except that through the door, the exit pedestal isn't actually there, and is instead replaced with a floor switch which, once pressed, lowers the ground in the middle of the arena, leading to a lower section of the shrine. Ooh, see, things are now getting interesting. Once you get down there, you're presented with a labyrinth filled to the brim with multiple Guardian Scouts, and what seemed like an incredibly easy fight now turns out to be a surprisingly lengthy stealth-based combat shrine. If you go rushing in to try and deal with these Guardian Scouts scattered across this maze, they will kill you almost immediately, so you really have to be strategic with your placement and timing. But what is truly the best thing about the shrine is its replayability. After you complete it for the first time and return the one hit obliterator to its resting place, wait for a blood moon to come and then revisit the shrine. The whole fight and labyrinth will be reset, and the one hit gimmick will no longer be present, so now the shrine feels like a beat em up gauntlet rather than a stealth labyrinth. This shrine truly defied all expectations in so many ways, and the whole way it's laid out makes it one of the best shrines in this game. If only the test of strength shrines were as all unique as this one. It's just such a shame, honestly, but at least we got this gem in the bundle of the DLC shrines. 
Number 4, No Raija Shrine. The 4 wins. This here is probably the most ingenious and creative shrine in this game. You'll see why I think that as soon as I explain what gimmicks and challenges this shrine presents. After activating a shock switch to power a wind turbine, riding the gust will lead you to a massive shrine room with a giant tower rotating in the middle. The trick is you don't actually want to land on the tower and instead want to use the four winds surrounding it to maneuver your way around it. By doing this you can use the time slow while shooting an air mechanic to activate four shock switches, each of which require different methods of activating, with each method making you feel like a pro. One shock switch requires you to ride wind that's blowing inside the tower to do 180 trick shot, while a second switch can be activated while the power fan of the door blocking it is over one of the four wind turbines. And the best shock switch in this shrine has you shoot an extremely precise shot through railings to activate a shock switch far within the tower. Not only is this shrine extremely fun all the way through, but the whole concept of just having this like huge rotating tower that you have to shoot stuff on while you're riding wind all over it is just so ingenious, like, who thought of this? Like, this is cool, man. The developers not only were creative enough to come up with this whole shrine idea in the first place, but it's extremely surprising that they executed it so well, especially for a DLC shrine. Go ahead, show me a more creative shrine than this one, I dare you. Oh wait, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't one. Number 3, Shoraha Shrine, Blue Flame. This is the third or shrine in the whole game, simply because this of shrine is destroyed required. my mental I know. 25 minutes from this shrine sucks. I can't believe that you put the most I ain't doing Okay, you know, yeah, okay, sure, I get it. A lot of people don't like this shrine, cause, oh no, it's too lengthy, or, oh no, it requires too many arrows. Yet, you know, it's funny, cause I thought a lot of people wanted the shrines in this game to be longer and harder. Oh well, don't worry, cause y'all's opinions aren't valid anyways, because Blue Flame is an absolutely amazing shrine. Expansive layout, fun gameplay, cool concepts, enjoyable gimmicks, moderately lengthy, a ridiculous amount of treasures, tons of challenges and puzzles. I mean, come on, what more could you want from the shrine? Oh no, it takes 15 minutes to complete, what an unnecessarily long shrine! Wrong. 15 minutes is nothing compared to what the old Zelda dungeons were like. And seeing as how a lot of fans were saying that they missed these older dungeons, you'd think they'd like this one, you know? Oh, boo hoo! It uses more than 10 arrows! It's the worst shrine in the game! Wrong again! If anything, the fact that this challenge is in the shrine even use that many arrows shows that it's a better designed shrine, as it means that the puzzles are more in depth and won't be ridiculously easy enough to where you breeze through them in a minute's time. Each puzzle feels like it builds upon the last as they constantly get more challenging and more creative. The last challenge especially where you have to use a charge attack to light the, all the torches around you is exceptionally cool and inventive. I think so many people don't like this shrine because they want the challenges to be just something that they can breeze through while doing the overworld, but that's not what I look for when going through these shrines. Since I look at the creativity, length, enjoyability, difficulty, and treasure, I find Blue Flame to be easily one of the uttermost best shrines in this game. Number 2, Kam Yatak Shrine, Trial of Power. You might be surprised that this shrine isn't at number 1 on the list because it's usually the one everybody gushes about when doing a top 10 shrine. Just hang on, we'll get to number 1, the best shrine in this game in a moment. As for this shrine, the layout is extremely similar to the Blue Flame Shrine, as the challenges are just fun, extremely numerous, and enjoyable. But Bramble Gaming, you might be saying, the shrine has a motion control part, so it's automatically bad. Well, guess what, you heck? By just using a combination of magnesis and stasis, you don't even have to use the motion control station to complete this puzzle. That just even goes to show how more well-designed this shrine is, because they included an option to not use the motion controls for players that don't like them. What else can I say about this shrine to justify its placement that I haven't already like said for every single other shrine in like the top 30? It's very lengthy, but it doesn't really have any moments where it feels tedious. The treasures are top tier, the puzzles and challenges actually take some thought, and there's also a ton of combat mixed in with everything else here. And even when you think it's completely over, it just keeps on going, man. However, despite the awesomeness of the shrine, it's still, in my opinion, not the absolute best in this game, although it does come pretty close. And here we have it. Number 1, Ka Okio Shrine, Wind Guide. Ah, it's a masterpiece. Basically every single positive thing I've said about level design with the other shrines on this list applies to this one. It introduces an exceptionally creative and ingenious gimmick, develops that gimmick, and then adds a giant twist to that mechanic in the last extremely expansive puzzle. 
One of the best features of the shrine is that it teases you with the ending pedestal after the second challenge because it knows that you think it's about to end. But then you figure out you need a key to access it and come to find out that the shrine is a whole lot bigger than you. Man, just kidding, dumbos. The best shrine in this game is obviously the Mia Hamagana apparatus. Oh my gosh, it is such a good shrine. And there you freaking go. That was all 136 shrines in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, ranked from worst to best. Now if you don't mind, I'm going to go power nap for a month. <laughs> and if you're still watching this video, I ask that you please highly consider subscribing and liking this video, as that would help me out so much more than you would imagine. And don't forget to buy my new hot single, it's the home of the gaming, coming out on iTunes and Spotify, probably never. If you want to see more mega rankings, you can vote for them in the top right corner, I guess. But if I do more, they wouldn't be as long as this one, because part of the joke here was that the script was unnecessarily long. Uh, at the same time, I felt like it should be, because the trines are so in-depth and creative. Alright, Bambi Gambles, over and out.